morning. Welcome everyone to the electrophysiology section of the Methodist Cardiovascular Boot Camp. My name is Wilson Lamb, and I get the pleasure of introducing Antiarrhythmics 101 to you guys. What may be a drier subject for most, I'm gonna try to keep it a little bit lively so that we're gonna teach home a couple of key points. For the general cardiology fellows, really there are two important things. What do you need to pass your boards, and what do you need for real life? I'm gonna to try to give you guys a structure, a way to organize topics, and then really to know the indications and the common uses of these medications. Now, it depends if you're a lumper or a splitter. If you're a lumper, then you like to throw everything just into big categories. If you're a splitter, you really wanna know each and every little detail. So, Vaughn Williams in 1970 came up with the original score uh, scale, class one sodium channels, class two beta blockers, class three potassium, class four calcium, class five if they were other and couldn't be characterized. 20 years later, and almost 30 years ago, a lot of electrophysiologists met in Sicily. Maybe an hour of discussion to get this out and a lot of vacation time. But this is essentially the Sicilian gambit, which breaks through every little bit of beta blocker, potassium, sodium, and how they hit multiple receptors. So if you're a splitter, you like the Sicilian. I'm more of a lumper, so I prefer the Vaughn Williams and knowing special indications. It's like Derek Zoolander said, uh, it, they're the same thing. Blue steel, magnum, the same thing. Okay, so now that we've lined up a little bit, you really want to categorize the Vaughn Williams into the medium, the 1As, the weak, 1Bs, and the strong, 1C sodium channel blockers. We aren't really going to cover beta blockers or calcium channel blockers too much. Well, we're not going to cover the class 5, DIG, adenosine, and magnesium, but your class 3s are your potassium channel blockers, and those are the ones we're going after. You guys know about beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, how they affect the sinus and the AV nodes. You know that digoxin, adenosine, they block the AV node, but class 1 predominantly impacts the QRS. Class 3 predominantly prolongs your QT. That's a good take-home point. So when you look at the EKG, Again, beta and calcium channel blockers in your PR. QRS is gonna be your sodium channel blockers, and then potassium channel blockers uh, prolong your QT. The 1A, which are your medium or your intermediate sodium channel blockers, the thing you want to remember is that their byproducts are actually potassium channel blockers too, and on some boards they'll show up as that lupus-like reaction. Procainamide, quinidine, and disopyramide are listed here. Procainamide, the buzzword is going to be atrial fibrillation in Wolf Parkinson White, and it's renally and hepatically cleared as its metabolite NAP, or, or the N-acetyl uh, procainamide uh, form. Quinidine, you'll want to know that it's, it blocks the ITO, and so it's a second-line agent that we sometimes use in Brugada. And disopyramide only shows up for a few reasons, vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy atrial fibrillation. So these guys... If this is the normal QRS, it slows it down a little and prolongs your QT because of the potassium channel blockade. I'm gonna put a color code on there. Red means you're probably not gonna use it at all. It's probably gonna just show up on your boards unless you have some really, really old school docs. This is AFib WPW, irregularly irregular wide complex. And sure enough, the 2015 guidelines say that you can use ibutilide or procainamide. That's probably the only time you will see procainamide used uh, much in your uh, fellowship. The 1B are the weak sodium channel blockers. They have very little to no effect on atrial tissue, so their primary use is going to be in ventricular tachycardia. Some use it to shorten the uh, QT of long QT. Notice it's such a weak sodium channel blocker that it doesn't even prolong your QRS. It is just a very mild sodium channel blocker, whereas it does shorten the QT interval. Where black is the normal, the dashed red is what it becomes. Lidocaine is the IV form. It does tend to selectively bind in ischemic tissue, so we use it in our myocardial infarction patients who are having VT, and it's metabolized in the liver. Mixilatine, we like to think of as the oral version of lidocaine. It's best used in combination as a TID medicine, but it can have GI side effects. Phenytoin or dilantin is also a 1B weak sodium channel blocker. We don't tend to use it uh, physiologically speaking. And so that one you're going to see often as lidocaine. Yellow, green, yellow, and red. Red not going to use. Yellow probably going to use, but in your ischemic VTs. 
The strong sodium channel blockers are the 1C agents. They're commonly known as your pill-in-a-pocket agent for atrial fibrillation, but what they do is they slow conduction significantly. So this is your QRS being lengthened out significantly as a strong sodium channel blocker. That may cause things to conduct one-to-one -one in atrial flutter. So this is the buzzword that shows up on boards. You have to use AV nodal blockade to make sure that you control the AV node and you don't conduct one-to-one. -one. It can have negative inotropic properties as well. This is best used for lone AFib or no other structural abnormalities such as cor coronary disease, congestive heart failure, bundle branch blocks, conduction abnormalities, AV block, or any type of congenital heart disease or scar. We sometimes will use it to uh, control PVCs as well. The two that we use are flecainide, twice a day oral and renally cleared. It's a second line agent for the catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, or propafenone, which is a th uh, three times a day medicine. It also has a more beta blocker properties and it's uh, liver cleared. So it essentially really prolongs your QRS. And that one you're going to see quite often. A lot of us use this agent uh, as a first line for people who have lone AFib or PVCs. It's been about 13 years since the seminal article about the pill in a pocket in the New England Journal. And this was a classic example of a wide complex tachycardia that you're thinking, wow, this is VT, this is VT. And then if you give them AV nodal blockade, you'll notice that there's some QRS prolongation, a bundle branch block or interventricular conduction delay, and a slow flutter that's working its way on through. This would be a classic type of board's question of what's going on and uh, controlling the flutter. In the 2014 guidelines uh, for atrial fibrillation, they simplified it essentially to no structural heart disease or structural heart disease, and you can try anything of the antiarrhythmics in the no structural heart disease with the exception of beware amiodarone. None of us as, as electrophysiologists really like amiodarone except as sort of a last ditch option. But when you look at the options of coronary artery disease and heart failure, you start to lose flecainide and propafenone first because of their fluttergenic or their VT-genic potential, and you're left with the class three potassium channel blockers, and then if you have heart failure, your options are essentially amiodarone and dofetilide. So let's shift gears now and talk about the class three agents. There are four of them that are, are relevant orally and one IV. I classify of the four agents, two of them are light and two of them are heavy. I'm not sure if anybody else calls them that, but I call them that. The two class three light agents are sodalol and dronetarone. I like them because they can be started orally as an outpatient. Dronetarone more typically, sodalol if there's no other major structural heart disease. You can use them in coronary artery disease, and you should not use them in congestive heart failure based on the SWORD trial for sodalol and Dromeda for Maltat. They do have a mild torsotogenic potential. The d sodalol is the antiarrhythmic component. The l sodalol is your beta blocker. So I like to think of sodalol as my 50-50 beta blocker and antiarrhythmic, a lighter version of amiodarone. And it can be loaded up to, from 80 to about 240 milligrams twice a day, monitoring the QTC. Dronetarone, I like to think of as maybe my 90% antiarrhythmic, 10% beta blocker, and it's amio light, light on the effect, light on the side effects. Hepatically cleared, but not always covered on people's insurance plans, and 400 BID is the set standard dose. And essentially, these guys are prolonging your QT as seen here. The, oops, and so those will be used quite often, ones to remember. The class three heavies are dofetilide and amiodarone. Dofetilide has uh, about one of the higher rates of torsades at roughly somewhere between three and 4% torsodogenicity. It is renally cleared and has no beta blocker effect. When it first came out and uh, all of us had to sign up for a prescribing number in order to get it uh, uh, used, and it has a three-day hospitalization that most of us end up having to do, watching them take oral medications and monitoring their QTC. The company says 440 for a structurally normal heart without conduction on abnormalities, 500 milliseconds should be the QTC or less in uh, folks who have a conduction abnormality. Some of us EPs kind of push it a little bit more into the 520s to 540s, 550s, but remembering that there is that torsodogenic potential, so some people don't use it unless there's already a defibrillator in. Others are a little bit more aggressive. Amiodarone, you guys have heard about it, you guys have used it. 
It's a lot of people's bread and butter. It is the nuclear missile of antiarrhythmics, right? It hits, blows up every uh, arrhythmia, AFib, VT, but it also hits a lot of peripheral collateral damage. Liver metabolized, higher dose loading in VT compared to atrial fibrillation, and the maintenance doses are listed here. The IV has a little bit more beta blocker effect, so you want to be cautious not to use that in AFib with WPW. It's uh, listed in the new 2015 guidelines. And for the younger patients, we always want to have an exit strategy. If you start amiodarone, try to figure out, was it post-op and they're going to get further away from their stressor, or are we going to offer them ablation or a surgical maze with uh, a valve repair or valve replacement? Because amiodarone is one of these medicines that you don't want young people exposed to for the long-term side effects. And there it is, the 2015 guidelines that talk, it lumps IV amiodarone with digoxin, beta blockers, diltiazem, and verapamil, harmful in AFib uh, with WPW because it has a little bit more of that beta blocker effect but you guys are gonna use amio a lot and probably see dofetilide or ticosin uh, commonly. Amio IV, this is their IV bolus dose. You know it in the code doses, you know it in the uh, continuous drip form. But I do wanna introduce a medication that some of you may have already used, ibutilide. It's the IV form of dofetilide. And I like to say that it's uh, a four because ibutilide has a rule of fours. It's about a you gotta keep the crash cart on for about four hours afterwards. Has about a 4% torsotogenic risk. You wanna keep the QTC less than 440, less than 500 of conduction abnormality. K should be greater than four, mag should be greater than the square root of four. And it may convert your flutter or your fib back into a sinus, and if it doesn't, it lowers your cardiovascular, uh, uh, your cardioversion threshold to get them back into sinus. And that one may be used by uh, electrophysiologists called Corvert. Okay, two last things to throw on out there. You're probably gonna see these medicines one way or another. Ivabradine blocks the funny channels and it slows the sinus node. It's been FDA approved for systolic heart failure if they are relatively sinus tachycardic, but it's also been useful in the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and inappropriate sinus tachycardia. The side effect, phosphenes. It blocks the same receptors in the eyes as if you're staring at the sun and seeing it go yellow, orange, green, et cetera. It can be expensive because its insurance will essentially only cover it for the heart failure and not for the POTS or the inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Renolazine, a lot of guys are gonna use that in coronary artery disease for your uh, coronary cripple and as a last ditch anti-anginal. But it also is a late inward sodium channel blocker uh, that mildly prolongs the QTC and you shouldn't use it in very bad cirrhotics. It too can be expensive if it's not covered for the FDA approved indication of angina uh, that's uh, refractory to other medications. They did find in those trials that it would suppress ventricular ectopy and other people are looking at it now at suppressing atrial fibrillation. Uh, others are you looking at it in long QT3. So it can have some antiarrhythmic properties just in case uh, the future is bright for uh, some new medications that are coming out there. Okay, so this is the table. You're gonna get a copy of these slides. You have your intermediate sodium channel blockers, probably not gonna use them much unless you have an old school person. Know how they're cleared and know their purposes. AFib WPW for proc, quinidine for brigada, vaguely mediated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy AFib for disopyramide, and then some of the side effects or the downstream products, which are the potassium channel blockers uh, prolonging your QT. Your weaker ones, your 1Bs, liver metabolize the IV and the oral form for ischemic VT or refractory uh, VT. Your 1Cs, your pill in a pockets, lone AFib, or for PVCs, not to be used in coronary disease, heart failure, uh, prior surgical scar, or because of their atrial fluttergenic or their ventricular tachycardia potential. Your class three lights, AFib without, uh, you can use it in coronary artery disease, but not in CHF because of their torsotogenic potential, and there is a little bit more beta blocker potential in sodalol. And then your class three heavies, amio, side effects, dofetilide, three-day hospitalization, and then your rule of fours for ibutilide. With that, you now have a systematic classification to recall and uh, what their use is. Know the effects on the EKG, the sodium channels on the QRS, potassium channels on the QT, or their beta blocker effect to slow, uh, prolong the PR. Those are potential board questions. 
Think about their potency, their clearance, from which organ, the frequency of, of use, side effects, cost coverage, uses for AFib or VT, and then the board testable consequences, such as atrial flutter, AFib WPW, and the contraindicated uses. And with that, we'll close. <laughs>